there's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your our living Lord. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome on this uh, wonderful day when we can celebrate the sacrament of confirmation. As Megan said, even though two months late, the Holy Spirit takes his time. You know, that's okay. But today we give thanks to God for the gift of the Spirit that will be shared with all of our young adults here today after your time of instruction and prayer and hopefully practicing of the faith uh, today the holy spirit really becomes a part of your life in a in a more powerful way as you cooperate with that holy spirit to be the best christians you could be in the years ahead so we congratulate you and uh, look forward to this celebration 
Let us begin by calling to mind our sins because God sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. So through the power of the Spirit, let us ask the Lord to free us from anything that stands in the way of our relationship with him. Lord Jesus, for the times that we have failed to love you above all things, Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, for our failure to love our neighbor as we should, Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, for our reluctance to embrace ourselves as children of God, Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Father, fulfill for these young men and women your gracious promise, so that by the coming of the Holy Spirit, they may become witnesses before the world to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. There is no God besides you who have the care of all that you need show you have not unjustly condemned, for your might is the source of all justice. Your mastery over all things makes you lenient to all, for you show your might when the perfection of your power is disbelieved. And in those who know you, you rebuke temerity. But though you are master of might, you judge with clemency, and with much lenience you govern us, for power, whenever you will, attends you. And you taught your people by these deeds that those who are just must also be kind. And you gave your children good ground for hope that you would permit repentance for their sins. The word of the Lord. Pity on me, oh, give your 
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, the Spirit comes to the aid of our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. And the one who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit. Because he intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus proposed another parable to the crowd, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who sowed good seed in the field. While everyone was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds all through the wheat and then went off. When the crop grew and bore fruit, the weeds appeared as well. The slaves of the householder came to him and said, Master, did not you sow good seed in your field? Where have the weeds come from? He answered, The enemy has done this. His slaves said to him, Do you want us to go out and pull them up? He replied, No. If you pull up the weeds, you might pull up the wheat along with it. Let them grow together until harvest. Then at harvest time, I will say to the harvesters, First collect the weeds, tie them in bundles for burning, but gather the wheat into my barn. The Gospel of the Lord. Some of you know that uh, there are three of us boys in my family. I was the oldest, I am the oldest. <laughs> and uh, two younger brothers were about 18 months apart. So we grew up pretty much doing things together, very close-knit uh, family, the three of us. And um, when we were young, like I think most families, my parents gave us chores that we had to do. So we lived in the country, and we had a lot of land, not a lot of land, but just open land around us. And uh, my folks decided that pretty much they would use that acre in back of us, acre and a half, to put a pool and then just a bunch of grass. Uh, but my mom was a little bit more particular in her tastes, so around the borders of the house she would plant flowers, things like this. And her specialty was planting bulbs. You know, you plant a bulb and then in season it starts coming up. And then it dies, but the bulb remains and then will come back again, hopefully. So. My brother and I, my middle brother and I, we were responsible for our chores were outside with my dad, helping him mow the lawn and clean up. And of course, me and my brother had to do the grunt work of pulling weeds. This is what made me think of this story when I heard this gospel today. Uh, so we had to be the ones responsible to weed the flower bed. It's not the nicest thing to do, quite frankly. It could be backbreaking work in the sun, and uh, I don't even think in those days my mom and dad let us use a hoe. 
or anything. We had to actually like dig up the weeds. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. So, um, and then my younger brother, he was still, you know, kind of small. His chores were in the house with my mom. So that's the way it went. Well, anyway, I remember one time my middle brother and I were doing, we had to, the day had come to weed the flower bed, and uh, we didn't want to do it. So we told my little, we told our little brother, we'll give you some money and we'll give you some, our toys, whatever, uh, if you do it for us. And so he goes, yeah, I'll do it. And so we went across the street. The family had three boys over there, our age. And so we used to, you know, terrorize the neighborhood and have fun. So in any event, uh, we came back after a couple of hours and um, looking at the flower beds, they were like perfectly clean. He had dug up everything, not just weeds. He had pulled up all the bulbs and everything was sitting in a pile. And my brother and I just looked at each other and thought, oh no, what, what's going to happen now? My little brother, he didn't know the difference. You know, the bulbs were just kind of coming up. He saw them. He just like dug everything up, put on the side. We were like scared to death of my mother. So eventually, uh, my mother saw it and just like livid. She was livid. Amazingly, though, my little brother who did it didn't get in trouble. Me and my middle brother, we got in trouble because we told him to do it without giving him any instruction. He could not distinguish at that time between what looked like a bulb emerging from the ground and regular weeds. He just like took everything out. So I thought about that story remains with me because Jesus tells kind of a similar story, a parable about a farmer who sows seed, wheat. And then the wheat starts coming in, but the workers say, hey, where do all these weeds come from? And the farmer says, an enemy's hand has sown those. And then they say, well, why didn't you let us pull up the weeds now? And the farmer says, no, don't. Let them grow together, the wheat and the weeds. And then when it comes time for harvest, we will get rid of the weeds and burn them, and what will be left will be the healthy wheat that will harvest, that will produce flour to make good bread. Later on, we didn't hear this part, but the disciples of Jesus asked him, what did that story mean? They weren't too bright. And Jesus says to them, the field is the world. The sower is God. The seed is the good people. The good people are the wheat who will produce a harvest. The people of God. The weeds are evildoers. And then at the end of time, the angels will gather the harvest. The evildoers will be punished, and the wheat, those who do good, who are righteous, will be a part of heaven. Pretty simple parable. The problem is we struggle with that kind of meaning when we think about good people and bad people, wheat and weeds because we take a story like that and then we feel like we have to apply it to people. You know, if you follow the parable, that means that there are evil people in the world and there are good people and righteous people. There are weeds and wheat in our world, which is the kingdom. The problem is, how do we go about judging who is wheat and who is weeds? Who are the weeds? And what should we do with them? You know, it's, we have the tendency to judge people sometimes on the basis of the way they appear, which tells us that we really should not judge people as being weeds or evildoers. But in our society and in the world, we're facing this big struggle now. Is it proper to point the finger at people because of their race, their religion, their way of life, their socioeconomic status? And is it right to say they are weeds? But we have a way of doing that, of course, in our society where we try to separate those people out on the basis of their actions. People who do evil, people who break the law, people who are considered to be trouble 
are separated out and they're incarcerated. And this is not a discussion about whether or not our criminal justice system does the right thing. But it is important to note that when we attempt to separate the weeds from the wheat, we can be making mistakes, serious mistakes. Jesus says, leave the weeds, because if you try to forcibly remove them, some of the wheat is going to get caught up in that, and you're going to destroy some of the good crop. And the same thing is true whenever we judge. And even though our society does judge and feels that it's necessary to do that, still it's not the ideal response because we know of good people who have been categorized as weeds, as evildoers. The other thing is this. Isn't it possible for some weeds to become wheat? Now, in the agricultural world, they would say, no, a weed is a weed, wheat is wheat, and that's true enough. But from the spiritual perspective, isn't it possible that people who are evildoers can be transformed to become people who are good and righteous? And then, do we give that allowance for God to do what he needs to do for people who are converted. Our faith story is filled with people who were rotten scoundrels. And then, touched by God, they became his disciples. The primary example is St. Paul. He was murdering Christians, murdering Christians, arresting them, throwing them in jail. And he was struck by God's love experienced a powerful conversion, became one of the great saints, one of the great apostles who helped spread the gospel. A man who would be considered a weed becomes wheat, the harvest for the kingdom of God. So one of the things that this parable tells us is that we have to be careful not to judge who are weeds and who are wheat. Rather, if we feel we are wheat, then we are to live out that calling and be good and righteous people. And then, as the parable says, we leave the judgment to God who will bring his justice to bear on the good and the evil. I think the more important interpretation of this parable is not about calling other people weeds or wheat, but looking at our own hearts. Because isn't it true that we are a combination of both? We are wheat and we are weeds as well. I mean, I would think that most of us here would probably consider ourselves to be good people. Good people. We try to go to church. We try to love our neighbor. We say our prayers. We try to be good citizens. So we would categorize ourselves, according to the parable, as the wheat. Goodness planted by God in the world. But isn't it also true that there is another side to every single one of us which would be better categorized as being weeds, our rebelliousness, sometimes our selfishness, bad and sinful habits, patterns of living that are less than healthy, times when we care neither for God nor for other people. So if we're honest with ourselves, we have to say, Lord, I am this interesting combination of weeds and wheat, saint and sinner. And therefore, if I'm going to make any distinction and sort out the weeds from the wheat, I have to start with myself. And I think this is why the sacrament of confirmation is so important, because it's the work of the Holy Spirit to help us discern who we are and what kind of people we are. And the Holy Spirit enlightens our minds and our hearts, especially if we cooperate in prayer, to better know ourselves. And it's the Holy Spirit who indicts us sometimes and says, you're a good person, but you can do better. The Holy Spirit helps us understand what are the shadow parts of our lives. How do we need to change? What needs to be transformed within us? What are the sins that we have to confess openly? What's the struggle that we have to undertake so that we will be recognized one day as wheat 
in the harvest of God's kingdom. So I encourage you to do the hard work through the sacrament of confirmation. Let that Holy Spirit kind of settle within you. And you do that in your prayer. And you say, Holy Spirit, come to me. Help me to see myself honestly. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the gifts that I already have. But I ask your help in addressing those vices, those sinful parts of life, you know, that are contrary to the kingdom of God. That's my prayer for all of you candidates, that the Holy Spirit will be at work within you so that you will become, you know, a person planted in the soil of solid faith. And then, as a person planted and rooted in faith, you will bear a wonderful harvest for the Lord and be a part of God's kingdom. And now I'm going to invite Megan forward to announce those who are going to be confirmed. Uh, good afternoon, Monsignor Perry, Deacon David, church family. So Monsignor, to prepare for this uh, celebration of the Sacrament of Confirmation over the course of two years, these young people, along with their fellow candidates, have performed almost 2,000 hours of community and parish service and works of mercy. They have attended formation classes, participated in two weekend long retreats and committed to attending mass each Sunday. They are eager and able to embrace the sacrament of confirmation and the relationship with Jesus and the church he gave us that this sacrament seals inside each of them. So it's indeed my pleasure and my honor to present to you these candidates for the sacrament of confirmation. Would the candidates please stand. So we congratulate you on uh, being here today and of course completing your instruction, which we say is important for people to know about the sacrament they are receiving so it's more meaningful for you. So we begin, you know, when you were, most of you, when you were infants, you were, your parents and your godparents brought you to a church to be baptized. You didn't have any say in it, right? But today, uh, given your maturity and your faith and your celebration of this sacrament, you have an opportunity to renew your baptism promises yourselves. So I would ask you to respond, I do, to the following questions. Do you reject Satan and all his works and all his empty promises? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, who created the heavens and the earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? This is our faith, the faith of the church, and we are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, you have already been born again in Christ through your baptism. You are members of Christ and his priestly people. Now you are to share in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit among us. This is the Holy Spirit who was sent by Jesus upon the apostles at Pentecost and given by them and their successors to all of the baptized. So now I'm going to ask our candidates to bow your heads, please as the rest of us extend our hands towards our candidate or our son or daughter, and let us pray this prayer. All-powerful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by water and the Holy Spirit, you have freed your sons and daughters from sin and have given them new life. 
Send your Holy Spirit upon them today to be their helper and guide. Give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of right judgment and courage, the spirit of knowledge and reverence. Fill them with the spirit of wonder and awe in your presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated at this time. So the first part of confirmation, the sacrament, is that when we extend hands over you and say the prayer of the church, asking the Holy Spirit to send you the gifts that the Spirit brings. This second part of the sacrament is the actual anointing. So with your sponsor, uh, candidates will come forward to me. Sponsor, you place your hand on your candidate's shoulder. And then with chrism oil, that is blessed by our bishop, um, I will anoint you on your forehead first with the sign of the cross. And I will say, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you say, amen. And then I'll say, peace be with you, and you say, and with your spirit. Okay? Sounds pretty easy.
much, okay? Okay, if you'll stand now as we continue with our prayers for our newly confirmed and for all of God's people, and our response to each petition will be, Come, Holy Spirit. For Pope Francis, our Bishop Joseph, Monsignor Perry, our deacons, and all who serve the church, that they may continue to work with the help of the Holy Spirit, we pray to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. For peace in our world, our nation, and our local communities, that we will learn to live together with love and understanding, we pray to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. For all who are treated unjustly because of race, religion, or way of life, that we may always defend the dignity of every person, we pray to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. For all our young people who have been confirmed today that they will live fuller, more Christian lives through the gifts they receive, we pray to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. For all parents, sponsors, and teachers, that they may know our gratitude and be blessed in knowing they have made a difference in the lives of these young people, we pray to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. For all who are sick, especially those dealing with the coronavirus, and all doctors, nurses, and health care providers, that God will keep them safe from harm, we pray to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. For all who have died, especially our loved ones, family members, and friends, that they will be welcomed to the eternal life of heaven, we pray to the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people, and now we ask that your Spirit fill our hearts with love and peace so that we may shine your light through our words and actions. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated now as we continue with our Mass. Pray, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive in your mercy, O Lord, the prayers of your servants. Grant that by being conformed more perfectly to your Son, they may grow steadily in bearing witness to him as they share in the memorial of his redemption, by which he gained for us your Holy Spirit. Grant this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you bestow gifts that are suited to every season, and you guide the governance of your church in wonderful ways. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you come to our aid, so that with hearts always subject to you, we may never fail to seek your help in times of trouble, 
nor cease to give you thanks in times of joy. And so, in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you as we proclaim. Please kneel if you are able or be seated. Father, you are holy indeed, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, Father, as we celebrate this memorial of Christ's death and resurrection, we offer you the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and we give thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and serve you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, Bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope and Joseph our Bishop and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her husband, with the apostles and martyrs, St. Elizabeth, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, that we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Please stand now and join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, so that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
for the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. You may all, sorry, please drop. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. <laughs> I think your microphone's off. Is it on? Or? It's weird. <laughs> Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Since this Mass is being live-streamed, uh, for those who may be viewing at home and who wish to make spiritual communion, please pray with me. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Please remove your uh, masks when you come to communion. i 
want to thank uh, first and foremost uh, Megan, our high school youth ministry and confirmation director, and her team of people, uh, her team members who helped uh, give instruction and who continue to do so. Let's thank them very much. Thank you, uh, Katie, and uh, what's your name? Anthony, Tony. <laughs> Say thank you so much for the beautiful music you guys did. Good job. <laughs> thank you also to our film crew. You know, they're uh, good guys, volunteers, put in a lot of hours to make sure that because of the cap that we have on church attendance, we want to make uh, it possible for people at home to celebrate with you, those who cannot be here. So thank you guys very much for your good work. <laughs> and last but not least, thank you to our uh, newly confirmed. Congratulations to your parents and your grand, uh, grandparents, godparents, relatives, next door neighbors, everybody. No, <laughs> thanks. And so at the end, yes. At the end of this Mass, if you just stay seated, and then uh, we'll be able to take some photos with you afterwards. Okay, let us stand now and close in prayer. Accompany with your blessing from this day forward, Father, those who have been anointed with the Holy Spirit and nourished by the sacrament of your Son, so that with all the trials of life overcome, they may bring joy to your church by their holiness and through their works and their charity foster growth of the faith in the world. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.